All right, good evening. It is great to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. A few announcements as we get started here this evening. Um, Seth announced uh, a lot of these in the morning service, but one that was brought to our attention this week, an opportunity. Um, there is a, a seminar going to be held at the First Baptist Church um, called Shepherding a Child's Heart. And um, that will be March 25th through the 26th. And, and there are some bulletins left, and there's a handout in regards to that. And so if that's something that would interest you, um, would encourage you to uh, consider registering online for that event. Um, and if you go to First Baptist Church's website, which on the handout, it gives you all the information. You can see cost, times. There is some child care available, a limited amount. But uh, that's definitely an opportunity I think Dr. Ted Tripp is the one who's leading that, uh, would be a great opportunity. Um, also another great opportunity is if you have children in grades first through six, or you know kiddos that are in grades first through six, um, there will be the laser tag party this Friday evening from six to nine in the church gym with evangelist Forrest Chapman. And so that is an exciting opportunity. Um, I think Pastor Doug said there's a, a good number of kiddos who've registered, and we're excited about that, but there's still room for more. So if you know of any first through sixth graders, you can go on the church website and you can register for that event. Um, now, I know that some of you are like, I wish I could do laser tag. Me too. Um, but we don't qualify for that. We may act like first graders, but we don't make the cut. But we do have an opportunity Saturday from 10 until noon. And everyone in this room is, is welcome to attend that seminar. Um, Forrest will be, or well, Pastor Forrest Chapman, will be leading um, a seminar teaching us some of the tricks of the trade that he's picked up over his many years of youth ministry. I can tell you his, his techniques are fantastic. And so uh, it would be time well spent. And this isn't just for our teachers. If you have any interaction with children whatsoever, uh, this would be a two-hour stretch that you would definitely want to, to sign up for. And there's still time to do that. You can sign up, I think, in the lobby. And even if you showed up the day of, we would be glad to, to have you. And um, those are all the ones I want to bring to your attention. Um, there are plenty of others, including the, the senior luncheon, new members class, um, which there's help needed for the, the luncheon. But you can read that in your bulletin, uh, fill out the tab, put that in the offering box, or get it to the office. And um, like I said, you can, you can go ahead and read that on your own. But this time, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and start the service out that way. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, this evening, and we thank you for this time together. We we are so grateful as, as we see this bulletin uh, full of many announcements and uh, many ministry opportunities that we can be a part of, activities that we can uh, invest in. And, and Lord, that what's exciting is that equates to lives that are impacted. And, and I thank you, Lord, for those, those opportunities and pray that, uh, Lord, that you would, you would send the children for Friday night that Forrest will have the chance to share the gospel with. And um, Lord, we're grateful for this, for this ministry and, and Lord, even on Saturday, whether it's our, our pastors and elders or youth leaders, children's church teachers, uh, or just a, a grandma or grandpa or aunt and uncle or a neighbor lady who has interaction with children and wants to be able to, to reach out with the gospel in a more effective way. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for, for this opportunity Saturday with Forrest to, to be able to sharpen our skills. And that, Lord, we think of the senior meal and, and, and many others like them. Uh, Lord, they, they all represent lives that can be impacted by the gospel. And so, Lord, we're, we're grateful for that. Pray, Lord, you would continue to equip us as your people, uh, that, Lord, we'd be sharpened and ready to go in those areas. Um, Lord, as we're gathered here together tonight, we, we're mindful of those who, who are struggling. We're mindful of those who are hurting. Um, Lord, I think of the request that was asked of us uh, by, by Stephanie Zitzler to pray for her, her college best friend. Uh, Lord, whose who's, uh, 16-year-old son took his life on, on Friday. Um, Lord, we, we can get wrapped into ourselves and, and the things that we're facing, and, and Lord, we can ne neglect to, to pray for those around us. And, and Lord, I thank you that uh, Stephanie was able to, is able to encourage her friend and, and her family in, in letting her know that there are church families that are praying for them. And I pray that, Lord, in this, this time of, of grief, this time of sorrow, in this deep valley that this family is walking, that they would be able to find the, the hope and the peace and the comfort and the joy that's found by looking to you and by, and by responding to the gospel. And so, Lord, we, we pray for this family. We think of our, fam our, our church family members who are 
battling cancer and, and those who are dealing with other physical infirmities. And Lord, we're, we're grateful for the, the hands and feet of physicians and oncologists and, and uh, pediatricians and, and uh, orthopedic surgeons that are able to take care of these different needs that have been prayed for in the last week or two and, and those that are ongoing. But Lord, we thank you that especially you're the great physician and that Lord, you're able to meet these needs in accordance to your will. And that, Lord, even through these times, these trials, you're able to draw these families and these individuals to yourself, Lord, to, to help them to see their need for you and to make yourself known to the community through these needs. And, and so, Lord, we're, we're grateful for that. And, and as we continue in our time of, of, of worship here together this, this evening, especially as we're praying right now, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that talks specifically about prayer and about how we approach you, what we ask for and why. And, and Lord, we, we thank you that, that we have this privilege. Uh, we have this opportunity to pray to you knowing that you hear us because of the walk and relationship we have with you because of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would comfort and encourage us together tonight as we reflect upon your goodness to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you want to turn your eyes to the screen, our call to worship in Scripture this evening is found in Ephesians in chapter 3, in verses 14 through 19, and in verse 14, Paul says, For this reason, this reason being that the mystery that the Gentiles could be a part of the body of Christ now being made known, Paul says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And as we join our voices together singing hymn 522, uh, may we reflect upon the truth of God's word as we sing together, my Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And everyone said, Amen. The next song we're going to sing is Before the Throne of God. 
before the throne of God above, I should say. And we sing a version that has three verses. I say this as a reminder to you that we're going to sing a fourth verse. I say it as a reminder to me that we're going to be singing a fourth verse. And to Cheryl that she'll be playing because our sheet music only has three. But you'll see why I included the fourth verse uh, once we sing this song. So let's lift our voices together as we sing before the throne of God above. For the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. For just the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me, to look on Him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this love divine. God's perfect Son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. This river's depths I cannot know, but I can glory in its flood. The Lord Most High has bowed down low and poured on me His glorious love, and poured on me His glorious love. And everyone said, Amen. I happened to stumble across that today, and I thought we had never sang that verse before, but there was no reason that we couldn't this evening. As we continue in, in worship here, uh, we're going to turn to our scripture reading, and that is found in Romans 8, 31 to 39. And as we consider the love that God has shown us through his son, Jesus Christ, and the apostle Paul said this to the Roman Christians, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? With tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, 
will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we consider the demonstration of his love toward us, let us sing together, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ who condescended Took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery. He the perfect Son of Man. In his living, in his suffering, Never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save. The hell-bound man, Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners, Hangs the land in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected. As will we be when he comes. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected. As will we be when he comes. And we are looking forward to that great eternal day, aren't we? What a day, glorious day that will be. But until then, we labor on in the strength that he's given us. I know that it has been February, about four months. I couldn't believe that uh, when I look back over this, but it's been four months since we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount. Four months. But we are not done yet. There is still work to be done. And actually, I'm very excited about the passage of Scripture that I think we'll probably start uh, maybe finish this evening. Um, I, I, I'm not promising anything on, on that regard. No rush, as I was reminded, to, to get through our text here this evening. But as we'll be going to Matthew chapter 7, and I'd encourage you to turn there. If you have your Bible with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 7. We'll be starting in verse 7. And if you didn't, uh, we have the pew Bibles there before you. And if you turn to page 675, you will join us in the Word of God this evening. But as we look at our message tonight, and the sermon's titled, Profound Promise of Provision. Jesus' Profound Promise of Provision. And as we consider that, a commentator has stated that when children first start to keller, they tend to have two problems. It's not just children. It can be adults if you're Pastor Scott, too. First, they might choose kellers that are inappropriate. They don't fit the picture at hand. You, when you want your grass to be green, you pick a green crayon, not necessarily purple or black or red. Uh, but secondly, once the kellers are chosen, they have a difficult time keeping kellers within the boundary lines, so staying within the lines. As they mature and they keep on kelling, they learn to keep within the lines, and they learn to choose the appropriate kellers for the picture at hand. 
And what happens is it results in a satisfying picture, one that even mom would be more than proud of to hang on the refrigerator. The commentator went on to say this appropriately. As children of our heavenly father, our prayer life often resembles a child's coloring. At first, we don't know what to pray, what to pray for, nor do our prayers stay within the guidelines of his will. But as we mature and continue praying, we pray for the right things and we stay within his will, resulting in a satisfying prayer life. With that illustration in mind, let us read together Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. The word of God reads as follows. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? You know, if, if, you know as we read this passage, and, and frankly, I just want to say, this is a passage that is grossly taken out of context all the time. And if we had not studied through the entire, and I know it's been a few months, been a few days, if we hadn't studied through the entire Sermon on the Mount together to this point so far, if we had started in this passage of Scripture with no background context, and I can tell you that the Word of God, context means everything. We don't take God's Word out of context and try to force it or force our lives into it. We want to read the, God, the Word of God within the context of the, of the, the framework it's been, it's been given. Um, but if we didn't do that, if we just jumped right into verse 7, chapter 7, verse 7, no context, and I just say, ask and it shall be given you, immediately, very quickly, we could find ourselves somewhere we don't want to be. And that's, that's mis, uh, misinterpreting what the Word of God says. And you know what? As we just said, with the children coloring outside the lines, we could find ourselves praying outside of the lines very quickly. But praise God. We can praise God together as we grow in our walk and relationship with him. Listen, there's a reason that we challenge you as God's kiddos to, to, to read the word of God for yourself, to study the scriptures, to know him more. Because the more you know him, the more you understand his word, the less apt you're going to be to take the word of God out of context and, and, to, to, and you'll understand it in its proper framework. And so our little theme statement here for tonight is this. And, and you heard this said um, in a roundabout way, while we're to be persistent in our prayers and our promise that he'll answer our prayers, this is important, there is an ultimate purpose behind them that assures this fulfillment. And God has said, uh, you, know, you ask and, and you'll receive. Um, seek, you will find. Knock, it'll be opened unto you. I mean, there, there's a promise there, but that last part is important. There's an ultimate purpose behind each and every one that assures the fulfillment of what Jesus says here. So our first point tonight is there is a, there's persistence about our prayers. There is a persistence about our prayers. And when you read Matthew 7, 7, again, it's pretty incredible. Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. You shall find. Knock, it shall be open unto you. And, and as we, and again, I will get to the significance of this, what, what needs to be behind this for this to be true. But Daniel Aiken has stated this. Prayer is the great blessing that puts our impotence, our lack of power, in touch with God's omnipotence, his unlimited power. Our lack in touch with his supply and our needs in touch with his riches. Prayer is an invitation to an extravagant banquet where everything we need, and I should have underlined that, everything that we need is present. But then Aiken said this, but like fools, we so often send back the word, I'm too busy. We send back the word, not today, maybe later. And there's a, there's a, there's a significance to why I said that. If there's a discipline that many within the body of Christ would say that in their own personal walk is lacking, it would be prayer. It would be spending time in fellowship uh, with, with the Lord our God in prayer. Um, I have been blessed to have been married for 17 years, and tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And, and so I don't need a designated day that's, that's been developed by governmental regulation to say I should honor my wife tomorrow. Um, I should love my wife each and every day of the week, each and every day of the month, each and every day of the year. And the truth is, if I'd never spoken to my wife in 17 years, 
what in the world kind of relationship would I have with Lord? And in some ways, maybe it'd be better if I didn't say so much. But the truth is, if I want to grow in my walk and relationship with Melissa, it requires communication. It requires knowing her heart, her desires, her goals, her visions, her dreams, her ambitions, specifically how it relates in her growing in her walk and relationship with Christ. We know what the same thing is true. You and I, it's not a suggestion that we come to God in prayer. We're commanded as God's kids to be in conversation with him. And the truth is we, we lack in that area because it's not something that comes natural to us as fallen men and women. And so, and so we're called to do what doesn't come naturally. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we read these words, pray without ceasing. In Luke 18, verse 1, again, Jesus says this, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times, how many times? Is there ever a moment where I think that I don't need to be in touch with him? I can do this on my own. Listen, I get myself in trouble most frequently. In fact, every time I think that I can do it on my own. He said that men ought always to pray at, at, at all times, as the New American Standard said, and to not lose heart. That means for you and I to stand strong, for you and I to keep at it, to not give up, to not give in, to not lose heart, to not lose hope. He says you are to, at all times to be in prayer. And as you look back at Matthew 7, verse 7, and you're going to see this on the screen, you'll notice that those three verbs are underlined. And I deliberately want your attention brought to them because in Matthew 7, verse 7, we get this threefold invitation, not just encouraged to prayer, but we're commanded to. In all three verbs, it says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open unto you. All three verbs in the, and it will be in the Aramaic as Jesus said it, but in the Greek as we study it, are imperatives. They're commands. It's not like, hey, it'd be a good idea if you come to the Lord your God. No, you need to ask the Lord your God, and you need to seek, and you need to knock in those areas. And as Aiken states, they call for continuous action. That's why in verse 8, and it's not going to be on your screen, but it says, for everyone that asketh. In the King James, and sometimes I deliberately use King James because you know what that ETH means, continuing ongoing action, when you see that ETH at the end of a verb. And so as Aiken states, he says this, they call for continuous action, so ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, and knock and keep on knocking. And the, we go into point two, there's a reason. There's a promise of God's provision. Now, Matthew 7, verse 8, it says, for every one, how many? All right, every one. Now, he's talking, now keep in mind, like I know we've studied this over a long period of time. But Jesus is speaking to those who have gathered around him in that mountain, Capernaum, who are desiring to be citizens of his heavenly kingdom. And so those who are heavenly kingdom citizens, he says, for everyone, not just the spiritually elite, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto you. You know, it's incredible as I thought back to this. You know, and Pastor Doug mentioned this. He said, you know, we read one verse today. We studied, we studied Matthew 5, 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we spent a lot of time on, on what that looks like, what it means. And, and you know, it's significant. And, and, you know, the truth is that they that mourn, we mourn at the first, and it leads us to, that sorrow leads to repentance where we come to Christ at the first. But once we come to know Christ, it's not like our mourning days are over. Like there is still a response. Like we are grateful for his grace. We are so appreciative of his mercy, his forgiveness, and his love. But our sin still separates us in fellowship with God and each other. And it's never okay to be okay with your sin. We should grieve that sin that separates us from each other and our fellowship with God. And he said, he said, Pastor Scott, for those who had an issue with it, can you imagine what the people in the Sermon on the Mount felt? We went through one verse. Jesus laid out an entire sermon. And, and it meant most commentators would tell you that this, it's not just word for word. I mean, it is, but there was probably more that Jesus shared in this sermon, this mountainside, uh, mountainside sermon session. And, and by the end of this, I can tell you that people have been beaten, punched, and probed in everything that they had believed in to this point. It wasn't like we walked out feeling all giddy and happy. They got, they got righteously uh, rocked up here. And, and you know what, what, what Jesus says, when you start reading now in verse 7, everyone that asks. That's pretty exciting. Because they lived their lives spiritually to this point where it was those who prayed the longest, the loudest, the most open places, 
uh, those who were the religious elite, the superior, the scribes and the Pharisees. It was those whose prayers were heard. It was those who were righteous enough, good enough, who had found favor. And now for them to hear that for everyone that asks, they receive. And he that seeks, finds. And him that knocks, it shall be opened unto them. And so when we come, and we're commanded to come in prayer, so when we, when we come to prayer, we can come expectantly. Well, why? Why can we come expectantly? You're going to see three brief points here this evening. Because he already knows what we need before we ask. And I do want to encourage you, if you have your scripture with you, to, to follow along all the Matthew passages I'll be looking here. They, they won't be on your screen. But Jesus already knows, and the Lord God knows what we need before we ask. And in Matthew 6, verses 7 to 8, we read these words. You know, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You know, it's, so it's not like you've got to try to wear God out with your prayer time. Like, if I say it enough times, eventually he'll get my point and I'll wear him down. Listen, children try to perfect that art with us, don't they? If they ask us enough times, maybe we'll relent. Maybe we'll stop at Wendy's on the way home when we've heard it 75 times from the time we left the high school till we get near it. They try to wear us down. Well, sometimes in our prayers we can think we need to do that. But Jesus says this, be not you therefore like unto them. Why? For your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And so, you know, one might say, well, well, listen, why do I need to pray if he already knows what I need? And, you know, that's one of the more simple questions that I can answer for you. Because that's the prescribed way for our needs to be met. That's, that's how God has called us to approach him with our request, with those needs, so that they can be met. That's what he's called us to do is we depend upon him and his sufficiency leads us into our second reason. Why can we come expectantly? Because he commands us to do so. In Matthew 6, 9 through 11, the Lord's Prayer, or the pattern for prayer he's given us, we read these words, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. That means each and every one of you. When you see ye, that means you, singular. You pray this way. In this manner, our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And so as we we come to him in prayer, and I know this has been a while since we've looked at this, but immediately we're brought to, who is it we're speaking to? Our Father. And he's called us. Jesus says, listen, as as a kingdom citizen, you come to your Father, and you come to him in prayer, and you remember who he is. First of all, he's holy. Secondly, he's the king of the kingdom. It's his kingdom that we're longing for, and it's his will that we long to be done. And then he says in verse 11, give us this day. Now we pray on our own behalf. He says, listen, we can come to him and seek him for our daily provision. And one pastor said this, and I wish I could quote who it was because I don't remember. But one pastor stated this, and I wrote this down at one point. How foolish it would be for us to think that our Lord would call us to do something and then not follow through on it. And then they said this, especially when you consider the cross. When you think that the God the Father met your greatest need, which is salvation, the forgiveness of your sin, for his own honor and glory and for your salvation through the work of his son on the cross, why in the world would we not trust him for our basic daily provision? But God calls us, and and Jesus in the pattern calls us, he commands us to pray to our Father for our daily provision. And then thirdly, why can we come expectantly? Because he promises to provide for us. And as you look at Matthew 6 and verses 25 to 32, and you know, and I know that we've looked at these passages, but these are, these are wonderful reminders. I don't know what you're going to be facing this week. I don't know what trials that you may be going through right now. And it's easy to sometimes wonder, well, how am I going to get through this? Um, how is this need going to be met? And, and it's, it's encouraging when you read the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who met our greatest need and has promised to meet every need. And so in Matthew 6, 25 to 32, the Word of God says this, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Don't worry what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment, more than clothing? He says, behold the fowls, behold the birds of the air. 
For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit, 18 inches, unto a stature? And why take you thought for raiment, what you'll wear? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He's like, when you look around the creative order, it's easy to see how God is able to take care of the most basic of creation. And Jesus is like, listen, as he shared this with them, you're worried about how you're going to have your needs met. And specifically, he's talking about in reference to living as a kingdom citizen to accomplish the purposes that he asked for us. He's like, why are you worried? Even your most basic provision of what to eat, what to drink, what to wear, and they're important. He says, if I can take care of the lilies that do nothing and the birds of the air. Do you not think that I could take care of the very ones I've come to redeem? In fact, in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, after calling us, commanding us to come to him, he says, what man is there of you? He asked them two rhetorical questions. They demand an answer that's, well, no, a good father, a loving father would never do this. It demands that, requ- that response. He said, or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, we give him a stone? You know, we, we, we typically tend to go out of our ways, don't we? I can remember, my, my, I won't share the specifics, but I know my mom one time got in some pretty heavy trouble when I was a, when I was a baby, did something that she definitely is not proud of today because they had a lack of provision, and she did what she did to make sure that I had what I needed even though it cost her legally. Why? Because even though it was the wrong way, and and maybe one would say after the scripture I just read, we should have trusted the Lord could provide. A loving mother or father will do whatever it takes to meet the need for their children, weren't they? Wouldn't they? They're not, if your child wants bread, you're not going to give him a stone. Or if he asks a fish, will you give him a serpent? I mean, if your son's hungry and asks for a fish, you're going to give him a diamondback rattlesnake? No way. He says, if you then being evil... As fallen men and women know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So let me repeat verse 7 and 8. Because I told you, and actually we're going to get through this. It's quite impressive to me. I didn't think we would. You could take this out of context. You could say, hey... I want a new Bentley, and I want, a, I want a seven-digit salary. He said, if I ask, I'll get it. And you know what? This is the opportunity I want. If I knock loud enough, hard enough, he said, to open the door. It's mine, right? And that what it's, that's what it says. And listen, there are speakers, there are quote-unquote pastors that say stuff like this, and they make a whole lot of money getting you to believe it. You just believe it. You just ask, give enough, say enough, faith enough. And if you ask, he'll give you whatever it is. And I can tell you one of the most prominent ones, listen, he wants you to have that six-digit salary. Does he really? Because how many of us have a six-digit? Don't answer that question. The rest of us will be a little jealous. Not really. He says, ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you for everyone Each and every, not just the spiritual elite, but every kingdom citizen that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be open. Listen, if we didn't take this scripture in context, we would be way off track right now. Our minds would be running way off course as we considered how this passage could be outworked in our own lives. But I want to remind us of something. Jesus did not come, I said this this morning, to be some cosmic sugar daddy to give us absolutely just everything that we want, that our full heads and hearts could come up with. He didn't. In fact, we, we know, I mean, we're in Matthew, but in Matthew, as, as Jesus, uh, or as God, through the angel, spoke to, to Joseph. In Luke, as God, through the angel, spoke to Mary, we find out very quickly Jesus came for a purpose, and that was to set men free from their sins, to make them alive spiritually and give them eternal life, and that they could live for his honor and glory and praise. And in Matthew 5.20, Jesus said some words that in the Sermon on the Mount rocked them to their core. 
He says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteous. That means to be greater than. Exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Listen, they looked at these men as spiritual giants, and they made themselves that way. Actually, these leaders boasted themselves. And Jesus says, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case, in no way will you ever enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, and you, you could read through the rest of chapter 5, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You've been taught, but I say unto you. Everything about their lives was to look different. Everything. What drove them, what inspired them, what brought them joy. Everything, including their prayer lives, were to be different. Not only would you sound different in your conversation, sound different in your communication, sound different in your conflict resolution, you're going to sound different in the way that you reach out to the Lord your God. And in fact, in Matthew 6, and again, these are passages that should be familiar to us. Um, we looked at them back in like September. But in reference to our prayers and how we talk to the Lord our God, in Matthew 6, 1 to 4, reference to our good deeds and in reference to our prayers, it says, take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I send you that they have their reward. But when you doest your alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You know, when you, when you hear that, and I know I said this is about prayer, and it is, the motivation behind that which we do, it's transformed. It's not about us. When they did their good deeds, when they gave their alms, when those, when those coins dropped into plates of the beggars or when they put it into the temple, they rattled it as loudly as they could. Why? So people could say, look how holy, look how righteous, look how giving, look how generous, look how good they are. And Jesus is like, listen, if that's the reason that we do it, then we have our reward but we lose that which God would have for us. And then if you read in verses five through eight, it says, and when thou prayest, when you pray, and that's like ongoing, like your pattern of prayer, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. You hear this repeatedly. Like there, there's, a, there's a time in our lives before Christ, that is all that we were known for is that which was pleasing to the flesh. And, and that we did it so really, whether we realize or not, that we might be seen of men. He says, verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, but, but you, when you pray, enter into your closet and when you have shut your door, pray to your father which is in secret. And your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. You know, when you consider, Jesus says that if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the Pharisees, in no way will you enter into the kingdom. We look at the motivation that was behind everything they were doing to this point. Who was really the object of their worship? They were. Whose glory were they truly seeking? their own. And so in light of Jesus' profound promise, I, mean, I get back to verse 7, that's like almost kind of confusing. He's like, don't be like them. Don't be focused. Don't be self-absorbed. Don't do it so men pat you on the back and say, good boy, what a good boy, what a great job, and we're so proud of you. Nobody else would do what you're doing. And then we start to believe that ourselves too. But how do we reconcile that in, that in light of what Jesus says here? Let me ask you a question. In light of this, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and him that knocks shall be opened, despite this profound promise of provision. Could these people pray and not have their request granted? Let me ask you that. Absolutely. Absolutely. In James chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, some pretty powerful words from the half-brother of Jesus. We looked at some of this in part this morning. 
James says this to the, to the believers in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church. He said, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Listen to these words. You do not have because you do not ask. And so that which they desire, maybe even that which they need, he says, you don't have because you don't ask. And then on top of that, even when they did, verse 3, you ask and do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. The King James says, on your own lusts. And, and you know, I want to remind us this evening, if we want our prayers to not just be heard, God will hear the prayer. But we desire to see that prayer granted there's a pattern that Jesus has given us. God has given us through his son for us to follow. And I want to take you back, and we just looked at it in part, but Jesus spelled this out to his followers. Like, listen, don't do, and I, I, how many times have you said as a parent, and and my kids reminded me, dad, didn't you say you shouldn't just say don't and not tell me why? He said, in fact, didn't you say that in the sermon? It's it's nice when your kids use your sermons against you. And, And the truth is, I'm thankful that God doesn't say just don't do it. He tells us not only what we shouldn't do, but he graciously tells us what we should. And so let's remember the pattern that Jesus gave us as kingdom citizens to pray. And, and so if my prayer life isn't lining up with this, then I should, I should ask God for the strength and the wisdom to line it up with this. And so Jesus says this, hey, don't pray the way they do. Don't look for attention. Don't think you need to weary God and, and, and wear him down. And don't just pray so you can heap praise upon yourself. He says, pray this way. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. That means you, each and every one of us. Our Father, which art in heaven. I love this verse one. Hallowed be thy name. Why do I mourn my sin? Because I am an unrighteous, sinful man who has been granted salvation by a holy and righteous God. He is so good to us. He says the first thing that you pray is that the name of God would be hallowed. Holy is his name. Your kingdom come. You're the king. It's your kingdom. And we long for your rule and your reign now and forevermore. He says to pray for that. Your will be done. Not mine, not yours, not this church's, unless mine, yours, and this church's lines up with what God's will is in his word. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says the first three patterns of this prayer is like you're praying in reference to God and you're praying on behalf of these things to be accomplished for his honor, for his glory. And then he goes and gives us three that you and I can pray in reference to us. But it's in light of his glory, his kingdom, his holiness, and his will being done. And he says this in verse 11, so in light of that, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need today to accomplish your kingdom purposes through us on your behalf. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Just as you've forgiven us, give us the wisdom and the grace and the strength to forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For whose? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And everyone said, that was weak, but I believe it. Amen. I'm just picking on you tonight. Can I say, by the way, I appreciate you're here tonight. There are some of you here, you didn't even know there was a football game. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think less of you. I, you know, it's something like, well, who's even playing? I am glad that you're here tonight. And I appreciate that you're desiring to study the Word of God. And I'm excited to share it with you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you for coming out this evening. But as we consider this pattern of prayer, David Platt said this, as he considered the righteousness that is ours in Christ. He says those, and specifically in light of this pattern that Jesus has called us to follow, those who have a qualitatively different kind of righteousness, he says that is a righteousness that flows from a heart changed by God, should no longer be consumed with the things of this world. Why does my prayer life change? Why does the object of my prayers change? Why does the subject, like, and I can tell you, like, I, I remember the first time, and I told you, the, the one of the things that grieved me the most about having, for those who weren't here this Sunday, you can watch, or weren't here this morning, you can watch the sermon. I'm not going to go through why. I was ashamed of myself at 16 again. But when I had to confess that sin to Pastor Gray and his wife, 
I, I was the one that they gave the opportunities to pray to open services and to pray before our fellowship meals. And, but I can tell you, I remember the first time I was put on the spot to pray was at the dedication of the land for the new church building. I had no idea at 12 years old what to say. I, I am glad that at that point we didn't have cameras, we didn't have media shout, and it is not there for me to enjoy for the rest of my life. Because I don't remember every word, but I know, not, it's not that it even wasn't polished. That's not even important. I know that it wasn't biblically accurate what I had prayed for. And, and I appreciate what David Platt says here. That those of us are righteous, it's not based on ourselves, but on the righteousness of Christ that flows from a heart changed by God. It says we should no longer be consumed with the things of the world. I'm not just praying for the betterment of my own life, at least not in a selfish kind of way. And while Platt, and, he, and, he, and this is on your screen, while Platt went on to fully acknowledge the struggles we'll face between the flesh and the spirit of God as fallen men and women, you know, my, your prayer isn't gonna be perfect, neither is mine. There will be times that we will selfishly pray. And, and I thank God for his grace in that regard. But Platt went on to say this in, as well. He said, nevertheless, Jesus' point is that even though we still battle these ungodly ambitions and even fail many times, there ought to be at least a competing desire in our hearts for the glory of God and for his kingdom of righteousness. You know, what, what's going to happen is, I'm, I, I, and I, the truth is, as the child of God, even as, especially as a pastor, I want to pray in accordance to the will of God. There have been a number of times when people have been kind of critical. They'll ask me to pray for something. And I can tell you, as much as God has given me his word, and as much as he's given me the power of the Holy Spirit that's risen as Christ from the grave, and it says that we have the resurrection power of Christ within us. He's our seal. He empowers us to live the Christian life. I, I don't know completely the mind of God. And so if you ask me to pray for something, and I pray that I ask for his will to be done, that's the best thing I could pray for you. You don't have enough faith, Pastor Scott. That's not true. I don't know the mind of God completely. And in this circumstance, this situation, I know that the best thing for me, the best thing for you is that whose will be done? God's will be done. And the more I know him and the, and the more that I know his word and his words planted in my heart, the more likely I will be to make sure that my prayers and what I desire will be aligned with his perfect will. And you know, the good news is, is that as we grow in our walk with him and our prayer life grows as well, we have the confidence of knowing that when we pray in accordance to the will of God, this is what God's word says in 1 John. In 5, 14 to 15, John said this to the believers. He said, this is the confidence that, which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his what? His will. If we ask anything according to his will, listen to this, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. And, and you know what? Um, I, I can equally praise God for his grace toward me that, you know, as much as I want to pray within the lines, I want what he wants for my life. I want what he wants for this church. I want what he wants for your life. But what happens when in my humanity I pray outside the lines? And, and you know what? There's not a question that none of us are perfect. We can trust that even when we pray the wrong things, he will grant us what we need. And in that regard, Daniel Aiken stated this, he said, Charles Spurgeon puts it perfectly. And now you're going to see Charles Spurgeon's quote. So you and I, we want to pray within the lines. Sometimes we may pray that which is not necessarily in accordance to his will. He says this, our heavenly father will correct our prayer and give us not what we ignorantly seek, but what we really need. The promise to give what we ask is here explained and set in its true light. He said, this is a gracious correction of the folly which would read the Lord's words in the most literal sense and make us dream that every whim of ours had only been put on the dress of prayer in order to see its realization. I like what, and actually someone in here said this just before we took the stage. Spurgeon said this, our prayers go to heaven in a revised version. It would be a terrible thing if God always gave us all we asked for. Our heavenly father himself knows how to give far better than we know how to ask. And I take confidence and assurance at knowing that even when I pray the wrong thing, God gives the right thing. And so as we wrap up our time here together this evening, um, let us follow the command of Christ. 
and, and to make sure that we're seeking the right thing, praying the right things. And can I tell you, this is a, a glossary sermon. We could have spent a lot more time. In fact, you could spend a number of weeks on this very passage of Scripture. But for you and I to see, and, and again, what Jesus is saying here, when you ask, given to you, seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Keep it in the context of this sermon. This is in reference to being a kingdom citizen of God's heavenly kingdom. It's seeing his will being done. It's seeing the gospel being advanced, his kingdom being built up, and we are a part of that. And so in, 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 in obedience to the command of Christ, let's, let's finish here with Matthew 6, 33. We're not to worry about what we need, what to eat, what to drink, what to wear. But you know what Jesus says? Your heavenly Father knows all these things. Verse 33, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know what the promise is, child of God? All these things, everything that you need shall be added unto you. And everyone said, amen. Uh, I'm going to ask Susie to come as we close out in prayer. And then we're going to sing uh, our final hymn and be encouraged as we sing together what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, together this evening. And we thank you for this time of fellowship together. We thank you, Lord, that we can study your word. And Lord, I thank you that we have the entire canon of scripture. And I thank you that, Lord, we can study it in its proper context. It's so easy. And so many take this passage in Matthew 7 out of context. And, and so many people are left disappointed and discouraged and, and questioning the validity of God's word and the, and, the, and the problem has never been in the validity of your word and your ability to provide but it's seeing it in the framework and the context that you've given it and I am so grateful that Lord anything that we pray in accordance to your will and Lord we know that by studying your word and, and, and through a relationship with you through the empowerment of the spirit anything that we pray in accordance to your will you will grant and our prayer becomes increasingly that Lord I would ask for the things that you would have and I would seek for the things you would have me to search for. And then I would knock on the door of opportunity that you would have me to enter into. Lord, knowing that you will provide amazingly and abundantly for those things, for your own glory, for the advancement of the gospel, for the building up the church, and the salvation of the lost. And Lord, I, I thank you that you are merciful and gracious to us. And as Spurgeon said, that even when we pray the wrong things, uh, that Lord, you are able still, and you do, give us still exactly what we need. And we're grateful that you rule and overrule in those areas. Lord, I pray that you would grow us. Uh, Lord, help us to, to see uh, that, Lord, you really do know what's best. And you really are, your grace is really sufficient to see us through, especially in those times when we pray and the answer is not necessarily what we would have it to be. Lord, we are so grateful that we have found not only a Savior, a King, but a friend in our, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for hearing us when we pray. And thank you for growing our faith that we could pray in accordance to your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand and sing together as we turn to 412 with your eyes to the screen? What a friend we have in Jesus. And we are encouraged to go to him in prayer. And I want to encourage you, take time if you've not been to get to know your Lord more. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? 
Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Amen. Father, we, we close out our, our time together here in, in prayer. And Lord, we're reminded, your word says that we should pray without ceasing. Uh, Lord, not to despair. Uh, Lord, not to be filled with anxiety. And I say that to my own conviction, Lord, that you, and I ask you to forgive us for those times that in our weakness that we don't turn to you. We look within ourselves or we, we doubt the situation because of the lack that we find within ourselves. But Lord, we fail to fix our eyes on the one who is able to do more than we could ever ask or think. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, there's nothing that we can experience on this side of glory that in your strength we, we can't face and that you can't handle. And so, Lord, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being enough. Thank you for knowing what we need. And thank you for meeting that need abundantly. And, Lord, as we go about the rest of the, the course of this week, Lord, if we're in Christ, we are your kingdom citizens. And your desire is that we would live that way. And you've commanded us to live that way. So, Father, I pray that the world around could see the Christ in us as we look in your strength and through your daily provision to advance the kingdom through the proclamation and the living out of the gospel. Uh, Lord, for our, our good and for your glory, we pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us, God's Holy Spirit power, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever, and each one of us said, Amen. Have a great week.